have from Country Diggers. Before we get in, into the video, I wanted to show y'all this cap gun I found uh, in the last video. I did spray paint it and you can tell the detail of it coming out. So I'll put before and after pictures of that up there. Okay. All right, and on to the video. Today, we're gonna be talking about Hernando de Soto. I know this is, I don't know who this is, okay? But since I found him in Alabama, Hernando de Soto serves, serves my purposes right now, okay? And this article is going to be on the passion of Hernando de Soto. And this article was written in 1967 by Timothy Severin. And it's on AmericanHeritage.com. So stay tuned. Before the days of the explorers, the Mississippi was an Indian river, spreading in a vast belt from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico was a multitude of tribes. Fox, Potawama, Kickapoo, Iowa, Illinois, Winnebago, Miami, Mostran, uh, Chickasaw, Otto, Oc Paul and others. Forgive me if I don't say these words correctly. <laughs> um, these Indians were in a constant state of turmoil, fighting one another and moving up and down the river. Even the Sioux, now associated with the Great Plains, were once a river tribe and paddled fleets of war canoes up the upper Mississippi. The Aborigines used a variety of names to describe the river, but it was the Algangarian name, Mississippi, which finally won out. French traders heard it from the Chippewa and the other northern tribes and carried it downstream with them until this word variously uh, translated as big water or father of waters became the accepted name from Montreal to Louisiana. The fact that the Indians were often friendly and peaceable towards the white man and that there were no difficult contracts or rapids for most of the river's course made the Mississippi easy to explore. Despite this, there was a gap of three centuries between the date which, when white man first saw the river and the time of the final discovery of its source. Small lakes in upper Minnesota, about 175 miles from the Canadian border, one reason for this lag is the nature of the Mississippi Delta, which is awkward to find from the sea and dangerous to navigate. Only when the Spaniards probed inland did they find the continent's largest river. In the north, climate was a great obstacle. French explorers approaching the river from their colonies on the St. Lawrence had to face winters in which temperatures of 30 degrees below zero were not uncommon. The land was covered with deep snow and the river was icebound. The rigorous winters limited traveling time increased cost and deterred all the brave or the ignorant from winter journeys in summer uh, winter journeys in summer however the french had an advantage over the spanish explorers of the lower mississippi and birch brink canoe oh over the lower mississippi the birch bark canoe this light white tough maneuverable vessel was known only to the northern tribes for the very good reason that the paper birch from which it is made grows no further south than Wisconsin. But the important reasons for the delay in exploring the Mississippi were political. 
The river was controlled at various periods by the Spanish, French, British, and Americans. Each nation was usually more concerned with protecting its sovereignty than with exploring the stream to its source. The first major French expedition turned back when it was halfway down the river because of fear of the Spaniards. Neither the Spanish, the French, nor the British held the Mississippi long enough to invest in costly expeditions of discovery. The Americas, the Americas, the eventual owners, were the first to spend substantial amounts of money on pure exploration. As, in, as if international rivalries were not enough, Many of the explorers were embroiled in quarrels with their own countrymen. The French, the most successful travelers along the river, were the most worst culprits in this respect. Their explorers were constantly hampered by lawsuits of one sort or another, usually brought against them by vindictive rivals who were jealous of any commercial advantage that might occur to the successful pioneer. Hernando de Soto was probably the first discoverer of the river, although early explorers under the banner of Spain undoubtedly approached it. In 1492, Amerigo Vespici is believed to have entered the Gulf of Mexico. Then in 1519, a fleet under one Alonso Alvarez de Pinata, or whatever, <laughs> searched along the Gulf Coast for the mythical sea route to the Indies. In the course of this voyage, he entered the mouth of the river, of a river which he said was very large and very full, but from his descriptions of the area, which disagree with all later Spanish reports of the Mississippi Delta, it would appear that he sailed into Mobile Bay. Spanish cardiographers called this coast a Michael, a Michel, A M I C H E L and declared it to be too far from the tropics to contain gold. It was nine years before another Spaniard, Pafilio de Navarraz, explored the coast. Navarraz and nearly all his men were lost, but a few shipwrecked survivors told of a huge freshwater current that had pushed their boat out to sea as they sailed westward. The current had been so strong for them to investigate closer, uh, closer inshore, but the interest of the Spanish authorities was aroused, not so much by the big river as by the survivors' report that there was gold in the interior of North America. The time had come for a full-scale invasion of America, America, A M A M I C H E L, or whatever, A M I C H E L, by a competent commander. The man who led this invasion and who was the first to confirm the existence of the Mississippi was Hernando de Soto. Hernando de Soto was one of the most successful men of his day and also one of, the, of its worst failures. He had been awarded a niche in American history as the first white man to set eyes on the Mississippi. But at the time he saw the river, he had no idea of the importance of his discovery. The course of his extraordinary career from humble beginnings to a life of luxury, then to a lonely heartbroken death on the banks of the river he discovered, unfolds like the plot of a Spanish book of chivalry. When de Soto set sail on the ill-fated Florida expedition, he was in his late thirties. 
He served with Pizarro in Peru, bringing back enough booty to make him one of the richest men in Spain. But he sought power, and that meant he wanted the ultimate crown of glory for, for the conquistador. An independent government for himself somewhere in the New World. After marrying a rich wife with good connections, he applied for the governorship of Virgin Territory in what is now Ecuador and Colombia. But the king had other plans for this region and made him a counteroffer of the governorship of Florida. The geographically vague term for the title known, for the little known as yet unconquered lands of North America, bordering the Gulf of Mexico, DeSoto accepted and a formal agreement between him and the king was drawn up on April 20th, 1537. The terms of the charter were precise. De Soto was obliged to furnish at least 500 men and to equip and supply them for a minimum of 18 months. The Spanish government specifically absolved itself from any financial responsibility in the venture. As his reward, De Soto was immediately made governor of Cuba which was to be the base for his conquest of North America. And once he conquered Florida, he would also become governor, captain general, and uh, A-D-E-L-A-N-T-A-D-O, whatever that is, of any 200 leagues of the coast he might care to select. I guess the owner... If successful, he would receive a lifetime annuity of 2,000 ducats. And this, of course, was to be paid out of the income from the colony so that the king did not have to reach into his own pocket. In return, the governor of Florida promised to support any priest the crown sent out to him. In short, he would meet every expense of the adventure and make no financial claim on the court of Spain. He would conquer and populate. And the settlers would not have to pay taxes for the first 10 years. Hmm. In, ex in exchange for the royal license, the king's treasury would receive one-fifth of all gold other precious minerals and gems, which the expedition plundered, bartered, and mined, and one half of all buried treasure. Finally, if De Soto deliberately failed to comply with any of the conditions in his license, he would be punished under the charge of high treason. The crown could do no wrong. If De Soto was successful, the king would gain a new colony, new subjects, and a fresh supply of bullion for the royal coffers. If De Soto failed, the court would merely sympathize with his widow, comment on the sad loss of so brave and loyal a subject, and promptly issue the Florida license to somebody else. De Soto, in fact, was not the first to hold it. Panuel D. Narvaez, Juan Ponce de Leon, and Louis Lucas Vasquez D. Allian had all tried their hand in Florida and all had failed, but this did not stop the ambitious De Soto. First, there had been great riches discovered in Mexico, then in Peru to the south, now surely somewhere in the heart of the unknown North America, a bold conquistador would find immense wealth. De Soto must certainly have heard some firm news of a Golconda, perhaps from Cabez de Vaca, treasurer of Navarre's success, unsuccessful venture, who had returned from the interior, tantalizingly closed mouth about his experiences. It was reported that, but for a squabble over his contract, 
Cabez de Valca would have joined up with DeSoto. As it was, he advised several of his cousins to go along on the new venture. This combination of rumor, experience, optimism, and the spirit of adventure <clears throat> conjured up a giant merge of certain success. Hildego and Peasant flocked to DeSoto's recruiting offices. Okay, uh, excuse me while I get a drink. <clears throat> eventually, <clears throat> eventually, 622 volunteers joined him. Among them, experienced Spanish soldiers, artisans, and priests, as well as such varied foreigners <clears throat> as Greek engineer, two Geneva. Genevese, four dark men from Africa, and even an English longbowman. The Army of Florida was the youngest, the best equipped, and the most professional ever to sail from Spain to conquer and populate lands in the New World. <clears throat> in seven vessels they put to sea on Sunday morning, April 7, 1538. Joining a fleet of 20 sail bound for Mexico, the transatlantic voyage was a gay holiday. Now, I don't think that's what today's gay is. This means a happy holiday, I guess. The weather held clear and the fleet stayed close together. Captains and Hildegos were I think this is Hildego, uh, Hildaga, Hildego, yeah. We're able to pay courtesy calls from one vessel to another <clears throat> and give graceful luncheons and dinners. They reached Cuba by early June and DeSoto spent a year there, establishing his governorship and planning the expedition. He had scored Spain for supplies, sparing no expense, and now he scored Cuba in the same manner. He even took aboard a herd of swine, a stroke of genius that gave the army a mobile larder all the way to the Mississippi and beyond. Finally, he said goodbye to his wife. She did not see her husband again. On May 30th, 1539, the army began going ashore at Tampa Bay on the Florida coast. There was no sign of Indians, and the venture still had the air of a holiday. The young cavaliers were enchanted by the beauty of the scene, the dazzling blue of the sea and sky, the white curve of the sand leading up to the woods of cypress, live oak, and ash. Tents and pinions rippled in the breeze. Horses were exercised on the beach to shake off the effects of the voyage. The first patrols probing inland also succumbed to the festive mood. Small groups of lancers rode off, the sea spurting beneath the hoofs of the, chal of the chargers to hunt in the woods for Indians or deer. It did not matter which. Soon columns of smoke rising up over the dense green of the forest showed that contact had been made with the Indians and that the natives were passing the alert from village to village. Then a patrol returned to report that the beautiful woodland was in fact hopeless country for cavalry uh, maneuvers. The forest was a maze of ponds and marshes separated by impassable undergrowth. The horses became entangled in thickets or sank up to their hunches in quagmires cutting their legs on hidden snags. Luckily, there were occasional Indian trails which followed dry ground, and on these footpaths, the cavalry could improve its pace. But the trails were too narrow for more than two lancers to ride abreast, and this crippled their effectiveness. The mass charge, the masked charge, uh, the favorite conquistador attack would be out of question in Florida, out of the question in Florida, 
And that was not all. The patrol had surprised a small party of natives. Two of the Indians had been spitted on lances, but the others had fled into the woods. Whence they began shooting arrows at their attackers from the shelter of the trees. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> By the time the patrol regained the safety of the open beach, two horses had been killed and several wounded. This was serious, for horses were irreplaceable and the Spanish depended on the cavalry to outmaneuver and frighten the natives. The optimistic conquistadors did not know it then, but the next four years would provide an almost daily repetition of this rough punishment. As ambush followed ambush, and the invading army was raped from end to end by the stringing, hit, stinging hit and run attacks of the Indians, half the carefree cavaliers would leave their bones to whiten in the Terra Florida, Tierra Florida, the land of flowers. Not long after landing, De Soto had a tremendous stroke of luck, possibly the only one of the whole Florida expedition. <clears throat> An advanced patrol of cavalry came across a band of Indians in a clearing. Without pausing to consider why the Indians were exposing themselves to the open, the horsemen leveled their lances and charged. The Indians fled into the trees, leaving one man wounded on the ground and another standing there, apparently in a state of shock. <coughs> the trooper, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a trooper was just poised to run the savage through when the Indian fell to his knees and made the sign of the cross and with difficulty cried out in halting Spanish, Sevilla, Sevilla. The effect of his words was electrifying. The lancers dropped their weapons and clustered round the naked man, who explained that he was Juan Ortiz, a native of Seville, who had come to Florida with Navarrez's expedition, had been captured by the Indians, and had survived by going native. He had been on his way to the Spanish camp with a party of friendly Indians when the Lancers had attacked them. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Another drink. <coughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> Juan, Juan Ortiz <coughs> was a godsend for DeSoto a reliable, intelligent guide who spoke the local dialect fluently. Sorry about the lawnmower, y'all here. Somebody's out mowing the yard. Uh, a reliable, intelligent guide who spoke the local dialect fluently, knew the Indian customs and could provide information on the politics and geography of the, la of the land. Ortiz was at once appointed to De Soto's staff, fed and given communion by the priest, uncomfortable in close-fitting close Spanish clothing after 11 years of nakedness. He went around camp dressed in a long, loose linen wrap. The army now marched forward <clears throat> with more confidence. Though Ortiz these De Soto, uh, Ortiz de Soto managed to establish contact with Mancuso, the friendly Indian chief who had looked after the maroon Spaniard. A peace treaty was arranged and the Indians agreed to supply the invaders with maize and guides. But Mancuso did not possess any gold and before long the Spaniards wore his hospitality thin. He realized that the sooner the Spanish army left, the better it would be for him and his tribe. He therefore employed a simple ruse, which De Soto was to encounter again and again. 
He informed the Spanish general that although he himself did not have any gold, another tribe some distance away possessed legendary stores of bullions, bullion and gems. Naturally, it would take several weeks marching to reach this glittering prize. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but he, Munzo, Mancuso, would gladly provide guides for the first part of the journey. These guides could lead De Soto to the limits of their tribal territory and then hand him on to, to the Indians of the, of the neighboring tribe. It was a childishly naive stratacism, but it always worked. <laughs> One chief after another used the same trick to rid himself of the Spanish army, preferably diverting the unwelcome invaders into the lands of a tribal enemy. Of course, De Soto knew exactly what the Indian chiefs were plotting, yet he had no choice but to move on. He could not afford to exhaust his men in the fruitless holding operations, and he was equally worried by shortages of food. Any tribal economy could support his invading army for a limited time only. As soon as the local stocks of maize were eaten, the Spanish were compelled to move on. They assembled a marching supply of food, packaged up their belongings, and forced the local chief to provide a small army of porters. Then the expedition snaked off through the woods, a long file of cavalry, halberdiers, crossbowmen, art bruisers, retainers, camp followers, including one or two white women, uh, natives, porters, and livestock. The expedition, an enormous questing centipede, groping forward, filling a path around obstacles, headed up the Florida Peninsula, Thence towards what is now the state of Georgia. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the cavalry was always busy. Besides scouting ahead, the lancers galloped up and down the long line of march, uh, trying to control the unwieldy mass of porters and footmen. The horsemen had to be everywhere at once. They provided the mobile reserve in case of attack. They acted as couriers, carrying, carrying messages between various captains, and they were allotted the undignified role of swine herds. The pigs thrived, and there were now more than 300 of them, happily grubbing for roots and nuts on the forest floor. De Soto refused to allow his soldiers to eat the pigs. They were to be preserved against hard times, and the cursing troopers <clears throat> were ordered to chevy the grunting herd along the line of march, taking care not to lose a single animal. <clears throat> Most of the heavy, heavy labor and transport was handled by the press-ganged Indian porters, and a steady trickle of fugitives vanished into the bush each night. <laughs> As the army moved forward, however, the Spaniards noticed that they had less and less trouble from their slave labor. It was evident that once a captive Indian was outside his tribal territory, he was reluctant to escape, <clears throat> preferring, preferring to stay with the Spanish army rather than run the risk of falling into the hands of a hostile tribe or of being recaptured by the Spaniards, who might then throw him to, the, to their packs of vicious war dogs. These Indians were unlike any enemy that the conquistadors had met in the New World. In Mexico and South America, campaigns had always culminated in a major battle. <clears throat> the native armies, no matter how vast, would be thrown into confusion by the Spaniards' horses. Completely unknown by the Aborigines, 
and often believed to be flesh-eating monsters. A shrewd cavalry charge delivered with tremendous punch could turn this confusion into utter panic. But the Florida Indians would neither be forced into an open fight nor collude, conclude a lasting peace treaty. And the Spaniard, Spaniards never quite grasped the extent of their bravery and tribal loyalty. One guide after another coolly led the army into swamps or ambushes, even though it was suicide for the man concerned. Even the smallest tribes put up a fight. They burned their crops and villages in a scorched earth policy, cut off and killed isolated Spanish dispatch riders, set ambushes, and hid their food supplies from the invaders. <clears throat> Any solitary Spaniard wandering too near the trees was liable to get an arrow in his back. And at night, the bushes around the um, Bacov Bacova rustled with hidden snipers in the early morning. It was in the early morning, it was not uncommon to find the headless body of a Spanish soldier dangling from a tree in view of the camp. The steel-clad might of the Spanish veterans had run into one obstacle it could not crush. Guerrilla warfare conducted by skilled archers. The Indians used a stiff bow that discharged arrows with terrific force and considerable accuracy. In one experiment, DeSoto watched a warrior put an arrow clean through a plate of Myelin steel hung up in a tree 80 feet away. With a second, when a second plate was put up behind the first, the Indian put his next arrow through both pieces of armor. It was not surprising that after a skirmish, the Spanish dead were sometimes found transfixed from one front to back by a three foot arrow tip with bone, flint, or a needle-sharp claw, or a crab. The most deadly arrow of all was a sharpened staff of cane. Its tip hardened over a fire. When one of those scored a direct hit on chainmail, the first six inches shattered into splinters that penetrated the inter... inter interests of the male and left an ugly festering wound that healed far more slowly than any sword cut. To protect themselves against these projectiles, the Spanish adopted, adopted the native armor of loose quilted jackets stuffed with cotton padding. Even worse, the Indians were the, were the swamps marshes and rivers. They delayed and exhausted the army, which often spent whole days wading chest deep through water. Fortunately, one of the Genoese volunteers and two Cuban half-breeds were engineers and knew how to make bridges and causeways. With ropes brought especially for the purpose, they lashed logs together and made roads across the worst obstacles. At the shallower rivers, the horsemen would ride their mounts into the stream and form a long line from bank to bank. Then the footmen would scramble across, clinging to stirrups, girth bands, and manes. Once or twice, crude rafts were improv impoverished or a block and tackle arrangement was used to reel the less willing animals into the opposite bank. Okay. Near the Swanee River in northern Florida, DeSoto finally got the stand-up fight he had been hoping for. A band of some 400 Indian warriors tried to rescue their chief, who was a hostage in the Spanish camp. After asking for a parley on open ground, 
They planted an ambush, concealing their weapons in a long swamp grass in the long swamp grass. De Soto was too experienced a campaigner to be taken in by their offer and decided to spring the trap. Stationing his cavalry in the cover of surrounding woods, he and several attendants walked out towards the waiting Indians. It was a characteristically brave maneuver, and it paid off. One of De Soto's chief lieutenants, Luis D. Mos Moscosa, waited until he saw the savages close in, then ordered the attack, and the Spanish lancers poured out of the wood, screaming their battle cry. The Indians were caught in their own ambush and could not withstand the horsemen. De Soto swung into the saddle of a spare charger and led the slaughter. Most of the half-naked savages escaped, but some were cut down and a few took refuge by throwing themselves into two small lakes nearby. There they swam out of crossbow range and hurled insults at the white men. De Soto saw his opportunity to teach the enemy a lesson and stationed pickets around the shores. All night long, the sentries picked off the Indians as they tried to swim back to the bank using lily pads for camouflage. The next morning, 12 exhausted Indians were still threading water, treading water defiantly. De Soto orders his best swimmers to fish them out and had them put in chains. De Soto had proved his point. His troops were infinitely superior in open battle. Unfortunately for the Spanish, this was the only occasion on which De Soto was able to show his flair and courage as a field commander. The army spent the winter in an open area near modern Tallahassee. The local inhabitants had fled, leaving behind their well-filled grain bins and fields of standing crops. The Spanish soldiers harvested beans, pumpkins, walnuts, and plums and built a fortified camp. <clears throat> a cavalry patrol reported that the Gulf Coast was only eight leagues away. On the beach, they had found the last traces of Navarez's expedition. Crosses carved on trees, mangers hollowed from tree trunks, and the skulls of horses. De Soto ordered up the men from the base camp at Tampa, and his supply feet arrived with fresh provisions. When these had been landed, the general sent his ships back to Cuba, except for one, which he dispatched westward along the coast to find a good harbor. The boat returned in February, having located an excellent harbor in Pensacola Bay, and it was arranged that her captain would return there with the supply fleet the following autumn to greet the expeditionary force and its second summer in the field. The Spaniards had spent a miserable winter under daily harassment from the natives, and now they were cheered by news of a queen in a land far to the east who received tribute of furs and gold from all the surrounding tribes. A native prisoner who claimed to be one of her subjects even demonstrated how the yellow metal was dug from the ground, melted and refined. The Spanish soldiers could hardly believe, could hardly wait to invade this promised land. And on March the 3rd, 1540, the Army of Florida began marching into the pine lands of what is now Georgia. It was a terrible journey. They were hacking their way through trackless forest which even the Indians shunned. Food ran out, porters starved to death, or went back to lessen the number of mouths to feed, or were sent back to lessen the mouths to feed. Men-at-arms threw away much of their armor, horses died. 
The usual food rations was a handful of parched grain each day. DeSoto ordered some of the hogs to be killed, but the issue of half a pound of meat per man scarcely eased the situation. Near the northern border of Florida, the army found its tribute collecting queen. The princess of, oh, I don't know this name, is C-O-F-I-T, Cofit, A-C-H-E-Q-U-I, Cofit H. Qua, Cofit H. Qua, I'm not sure. But she was a sad disappointment. Her gold turned out to be burnished copper, and her slabs of silver were sheets of uh, mica. The only booty was a heap of river pearls, extracted from freshwater mussels. The most of the and mo- but most of these were ruined by boring or discolored by fire. The Spaniards collected 350 pounds of the pearls and left in disgust. According to the legend, one of the dark men stayed behind to marry the princess and rule as Lord of Cofitachi. Though the southern part of present-day South Carolina, oh, wait a minute, through the southern part of present-day South Carolina into North Carolina, Tennessee, and northern Alabama. DeSoto led his army as the summer of 1514 wore on. One mountain ridge after another had to be climbed. Each river looked the same as the previous one they had forwarded. The maps that the 16th century geographers awarded pieced together from the expedition's diary show a random scattering of Indian villages, mountains, and rivers that reveals the lack of of topog, top, topo, uh, topographic variety. Excuse me. The Indians who struck back at the Spanish were the Choctaw, South Central Alabama. DeSoto entered their territory early in October and was greeted by their chief, Tuscaloosa, the black warrior. Now, uh, Tuscaloosa, uh, Alabama, Tuscaloosa, Alabama is named after Chief Tuscaloosa. And the uh, Black Warrior River was named after him, too, because he was the black warrior. But um, anyway, it was an impressive meeting. The Spanish generally clad, the Spanish general clad in armor on his charger, and the Indian chief seated on a pile of cushions, wearing a full-length mantle of feathers. Tuscaloosa greeted DeSoto warily, but seemed willing to let the Spaniards cross his lands. DeSoto responded in his usual high-handed style. He accepted the offer and then ordered his hobbiters to seize Tuscaloosa and take with the column and take him with the column. It was a fatal mistake. Tuscaloosa managed to send runners to his chiefs, to his war chiefs, summoning them to his capital at Mobella. Now some um they have recently tried to find Mobella. They have been trying to find Mobella for centuries, I guess. Or, or not centuries, but, you, you know, since um, they've started keeping records and stuff, I guess. But uh, in 2021, they, archaeologists found um, a site that they believe is Mobella. Uh, but anyway... Um, where they sat, anyway, okay, summoned them, them to his capital at Mobella, <clears throat> where they set an ambush for DeSoto and his soldiers. This Indian town was probably located near the juncture of the Alabama and Tom Beebe rivers in present-day Alabama. Has been uh, variously spelled 
um, Mavella, M-A-V-I-L-A, M-A-U-V-I-L-A, M-A-B-I-L-A, etc. <clears throat> when Tuscaloosa told him that Mobella held ample supplies of food, DeSoto decided to march on the capital. He moved straight into the trap. To make matters worse, he allowed his troops to disperse and forage. <clears throat> yeah, let me get a sip of water. <clears throat> when the main column reached the town, DeSoto was accompanied by 15 troopers and a huge surly mob of slaves, hostages, and prisoners. <clears throat> Despite the warnings of a Spanish spy who told DeSoto that Mobella was swarming with Choctaw warriors, the stiff-necked general decided to enter the town with Tuscaloosa at his side. <clears throat> As the handful of Spaniards passed through the gates, their attention was diverted by a team of dancing girls stationed there as decoys. Then Tuscaloosa signaled his braves to attack and they rushed out from the houses. DeSoto and his champion companions back towards the gate with uh, blows ringing off their armor. Five of the white men were attacked to pieces, were hacked to pieces, protecting their general, and DeSoto himself nearly escaped. DeSoto's life was saved, but his negligence was still to prove the ruin of his expedition. The Indians in the baggage train had seized their opportunity to escape. They had streamed into Mobella, taking with them all the Spanish supplies, spare weapons, and gunpowder. By the time the main body of the Spanish army arrived, the situation was desperate. On the other side of Mobella's uh, palisades lay all the equipment needed to survive the march down to the coast. Already the ramparts were lined with self-liberated slaves jeering and holding up their booty to mock the white man. For DeSoto, there was no alternative. He had to capture Mobella and regain his equipment. <clears throat> the siege lasted all day and it was a bloodbath. The Spanish infantry hurled themselves against the palisades, hacking at the long logs with axes but were beaten back by the crazed Choctaw. Finally, DeSoto had to fire the town and risk his equipment in the conf conflagration. Mobella was built of wood and straw and it burned like tinder. But with the flames behind them and the hall, bar hall barriers in front, the Choctaw warriors refused to surrender. They stubbornly resisted and inflicted heavy casualties. DeSoto himself received an arrow in the rump and spent the rest of the battle standing in his, his stirrups. The siege became a massacre of the Choctaw, but not until the last warrior had hanged himself from the rapids with his own bowstring did the fighting stop. And by then, it was clear that the Spanish equipment had burned with the town. The battle was a victory for the Spanish, but a victory they could not afford. In addition to losing their material, they had 22 dead and 148 wounded, some with multiple arrow wounds. Scarcely any soldiers had come through unscathed. They were burned, hungry, and exhausted. DeSoto had put himself in an impossible tactical position and had paid the price for his stupidity. By rights, his Florida expedition was finished. They should have all limped to the coast to rendezvous with the ships. But that was not DeSoto's style. He was stubbornly convinced that somewhere in the Terrier of Fl Florida, land of flowers. <laughs> he would build his empire, and he was too proud to return to Spain a failure. <clears throat> One of the 
When a messenger arrived to report that the supply fleet was waiting, he suppressed the news, fearing that the men would desert and make for the coast. By sheer force of character, DeSoto led his men away from their starvation and took them ill-equipped and battered into the interior for three more years of fighting. The fleet waited in vain to provide them with fresh supplies. Then it sailed back to Cuba, not knowing what had become of the Florida expedition. This is what happens when you're on a power trip. The siege of Mobila changed DeSoto and changed his army. After the, the disaster, the general became morose and spent some time alone, more time alone, brooding over his plans. With the loss of the baggage, the army took on the appearance of a gang of buccaneers. At first, the natives stayed clear of this wild-eyed rabble of men. They had been shaken by the ferocity of Mobila and did not wish to tackle the Spanish again. But as DeSoto moved across the country, his route took him into the territory of the Chickasaw Indians, who had never yet seen a white man and were famous for their valor. The Chickasaw resented DeSoto's constant demands for food, blankets, and furs. They planned an attack and waited their opportunity. DeSoto, however, was a chastened leader. He was more cautious and more watchful. It was Louis D. Mocoso, Mocoso, master of the camp, and thus the one responsible for posting the sentries who gave the Chickasaw their chance. Mocoso was one of DeSoto's favorites. He had been with him since Peru, and even though one of DeSoto's homeward-bound treasure ships had been wrecked through um, Macoso, that's his name, Macoso's negligence, DeSoto had forgiven him and had made him chief lieutenant of the Florida expedition. On the night of March the 3rd, 1541, he failed to set a trustworthy guard around the Spanish camp. Several hundred armed Chickasaw warriors succeeded in creeping within the range of the camp, each carrying a firebrand concealed in an earthenware pot. It is said that each Indian also carried three ropes, one for a Christian, one for a horse, and one for a pig. The fire attack was a complete surprise. The camp was in flames while the day's soldiers still fumbled with their breastplates and helmets. The sparks set alight the pigsty, and almost 300 squealing pigs rose to death. Only the piglets managed to wiggle through the bars. The air smelled of roast pork. While, while ac according to one account, the bacon grease flowed out over the ground. DeSoto buckled on his armor and rallied his men. The horses broke loose, and the thunder of their stampede terrified the Chickasaw, who fled, leaving the Spanish battling the flames. When the fire was extinguished, DeSoto saw the smoldering debris of his expedition. It was a worse disaster than Mobella. A dozen Spaniards had been killed or had burned to death, and 50 or 60 horses had been lost. The last surviving white woman was dead. Almost every shred of their blankets and garments had been burned. The men were almost naked and there was nothing to protect them from the cold nights. Nearly all the metal weapons had been ruined, having lost their temper in the inferno. And all, all the saddlery was wrecked. Everything wooden was now a charred mass. Saddles, lances, shafts, axes, and pick handles. The Chickasaw had not lost a single warrior. Under the, these appalling conditions, the Spaniards <clears throat> were at their best. <laughs> their resilience was extraordinary. Working furiously for the next two weeks, they rigged up a crude forge and using rough bellows, 
made from bear skins and musket barrels, retempered sword blades, crossbows, pike heads, and armor. They salvaged every scrap of metal from the cinders and cut, cut lance shafts from the nearest grove of trees. The runaway horses were rounded up and equipped with rope harnesses made from twisted grass. The men scavenged for skins and grass mats to make sleeping bags and kilts. By the time the Chickasaw returned to the attack, the Spaniards were in fighting trim and easily defeated their army. Muscago was demoted for his negligence, but there was little time for recriminations. De Soto realized that it was essential to leave Chickasaw territory before his command was wiped out by this warrior tribe. According to the Army of Florida, uh, gathered together the homemade gear and moved westward as fast as their wounds and burns could allow. In early May, De Soto's westward path brought him through forest and swamplands to the bank of a huge river bigger by far than any river they had ever seen in Europe or Mexico. The date was Sunday, May 8, 1541, and the army had been in the field for two years. The river was the Mississippi. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, that's going to be, this might be a two-parter, so we'll stop there. And I'll do part two later, okay? All right. Hope you enjoyed. See you back soon. Bye.